Okay, so this is ses session number nine, and it uh, the title is Hybridity and Chinese-ness, Finding Meaning in Theories. Dr. Juliet Lee Uy Tan Lep teaches global missions and urban missions at the Biblical Seminary of the Philippines. She also teaches ethnographic research methods at Asia Graduate School of Theology. Her dissertation entitled, The Hybrid Chinois, Challenges of Hybridity and Homogeneity as Sociocultural Constructs Among the Chinese in the Philippines. And it was published by Pickwick Publications in 2016 as part of the American Society of Missiology monograph series. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, please welcome Dr. Juliet Oitanle. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present hybridity and Chinese-ness. The picture, by the way, is my father. Yeah, my father is an old immigrant, meaning he came to the Philippines just before the World War II, okay, uh, or the Japanese invaded the Philippines. Anyway, this picture was taken probably around uh, early, late 50s or early 60s, okay? And it was a stand-in cowboy, and, uh, and so he just put his face. <laughs> <laughs> and I find this picture very interesting because he's very Chinese, and yet, interestingly, he took this photo with a cowboy suit, okay? Or cowboy stand-in picture. So today we'll talk about hybridity and how we can find meaning through theories, okay? So the objective, objectives for our, my talk today is who are the Chinois today or the Chinese Filipinos? And how can hybridity theories help us do better mission among the Chinese in the Philippines in this 21st century? Okay, just uh, some demographics, okay? Uh, Based on history, the Chinese have been traders in this country since AD 900, okay? So like hundreds of years before the Spaniards came. The population was 1.5 million today, and 52% live in Metro Manila. The origin, 90% of them came from Fujian, and 10% from Guangdong. In terms of citizenship, 90% of the Chinese in the Philippines today have Filipino citizenship. However, 10% remain to be Chinese citizens. In terms of language, they speak Minanhua, Mandarin, or Putonghua, and then Filipino in English, okay? In terms of religion, 85% are Roman Catholics, 2% are Evangelicals, and 13% and so forth are Buddhist, Taoist, and etc. Now, I started my, my manuscript with the question, who is more Chinese? Because when I was having coffee with my mentor back in 2000, 12, or no, 2011, okay, in Solomon's Porch in Wilmore, he told me one situation. He said, what if, okay, what if a Chinese Filipino born of pure parentage, pure Chinese parentage, okay, is sitting in a cafe and suddenly there's a Chinese from mainland entering into the room whose Chinese-ness is more authentic? The Chinese Filipino with pure Chinese parentage or the Chinese who just came from China. And that made me think, because I am a third generation Chinese in the Philippines, and that made me think whether my Chinese-ness is indeed authentic or pure, okay? For the longest time, I grew up in Chinatown, Binondo, Manila, and I always see myself as very Chinese. I grew up speaking the Minanhua language at home. I studied in Chinese schools. And yet, in the journey of my writing of this dissertation, I realized I'm a hybrid. <laughs> Even though of pure Chinese parentage, how pure it can be, okay? Um, I really enjoyed the reports of uh, Kuya Layton and Ate Lisa when they shared about their DNA testing results, okay? <laughs> and I wondered what would happen if I had my DNA testing too. But anyway, I was challenged by my mentor that as the world changes, so must we find out where people are and go to them, whether they are transit or whether they are settled or in transit. In other words, 
we should continue to study and do research about the people that we are going to minister because times keep on changing and culture changes. And so I find cultural hybridity most fitting in understanding the Chinese Filipinos today. So based on the works of John Nevdervin Peters, he defined hybridity as a process of crossing category. And those categories can be cultures, nations, ethnicities, status, groups, or stat status, groups, classes, or different genres, okay? He says, hybridity carries different meanings in different cultures, among different circles, within cultures, and at different time periods. Hybridity is entirely contextual and relational. Anyway, in short, after reading Peter's book, I concluded then, Hybridity for me, and in my dissertation, I defined it as the mixing of blood or inter-ethnic marriages and the mixing of cultures and or cultural elements within the culture. So hybridity is not just about inter-ethnic marriages, but it's also about people mixing cultures or cultural elements within a culture. Because sometimes we didn't embrace everything within the culture, but just one particular cultural element. For example, I love to watch Korean telenovela, and so that particular culture of a Korean, I accept. Sarangamida. <laughs> so sometimes we embrace something of a particular culture, okay, and not entire its entirety, okay, and that's also hybridity. So my next question is. Who then is a Chinese? For those Chinese who came from China, of course, they don't have these identity issues because they know themselves that they are Chinese. But for the Chinese and diaspora, especially the second, third, fourth, fifth generations, they sometimes struggle with this question, am I a Chinese? Okay. How do I measure my Chineseness? How Chinese am I? Okay. So who is a Chinese? Is a Chinese somebody who wears a Chinese costume? Is a Chinese is somebody who eats Chinese food? So who is a Chinese? Now, Ted Levelin in his book, he wrote about identity, okay? He said, a person's identity can be derived from the popular notions that people give them, or social scientists, or from themselves. And I added that identity can also be given by Christians or missiologists. And so let me introduce to you the different identities given to the Chinese throughout the centuries, okay? So let's start. During the Spanish period, they were called Sanglis and Chinos. During the American period, they were called Chinamen, Coolies, Non-Christian Tribe, and Aliens. And my son asked me, why are we from outer space? <laughs> now, there are also popular notions given to the Chinese by Chinese themselves or Filipinos. Chino, Cabise, Chequa, Inchik, Bejo, Barok, Bulul, Bulchiki, Singkit, or Singkot. Chinito, Chinita, Chinki, I change Chinoy or Chinoy. <laughs> now the word Singkit means Chinki I. And for, one, for a time, it was, uh, it was a label given to the Chinese, okay, with prejudice, okay. However, Stanley Chi, uh, an artist, embraced that chin, Chinki I, okay, and he created this comics called Chopsticks. Okay, and it gives a new meaning for singkit or chinky eye. It's no longer something that, you know, the Chinese is, uh, uh, feel bad about, but it can be a celebration of our physical features. Okay, another thing that is happening in the, Chi in the Philippines, among the Filipinos, is that they embrace many Chinese Filipino or Chinese mestizo uh, artists, okay, like Kim Chu, uh, Sian Lim, Richard Yap, and Julia Ching, okay? So these artists were very much, is very, are, they are very popular here in the Philippines and they are embraced and accepted by the Filipino community. And so somehow we see that there's a, a gradual diminishing of prejudices between the two groups, the Chinese and Filipinos, okay? In fact, a popular Filipina singer even created a song entitled Chinito, about a guy who is handsome, but with chinky eye, okay? And I want you to listen to this song, okay? Just for fun. Okay, 
The man in the video is actually a Chinese, okay? But he's from Naga. Naga Legaspi. He's also a popular uh, Chinese mestizo actor. Okay, that's it for now. <laughs> but the point that I'm trying to say is that the labels that were given to the Chinese in the Philippines throughout the history, there were negatives and positive. And I see changes that have changes had happened throughout the years, okay? And so, uh, somehow, the Chinese and the Filipinos were able to live peacefully here in the country. So during the Spanish period, they were called Sangli and Chino. Now, out of the many names, I just want to focus on this one. In the book by Benedict Anderson, Imagine Communities, he mentioned about the word Sangli. He wonders, where, this, where did this word come from? Okay, and in, the, in his book, he thought this book, uh, he, this word Sangli comes from the word Sangli or business, okay? However, the word Sangli actually comes from the word Xionglai, Changlai, one who often comes, because the Chinese often comes to the Philippines as traders, okay? And so the word Sangli comes from the word Changlai, and this was proven to be true based on the painting, okay? This is the painting. Anyway, this painting is uh, painted in the late 16th century, and it's part of a collection called the Boxer Codex. And it's now housed in Indiana University, or University of Indiana, okay? So, so the word Sangli means Chang Lai. Now, there were social scientists who gave Chinese different labels, like Hua Shang, merchants, or coolies, or Chinese overseas or sojourners, or Chinese people in diaspora, or of Chinese descent, okay? There were, they were also labeled as Jews, Jews of the East, immigrants, transnationals, essential outsiders, market dominant minorities, flexible identities, cosmopolitans, cosmopolitan capitalists, global cosmopolitans. Now, in the academics, in the past, they simply referred them as Chinese, or Philippine Chinese, or Filipino, hyphen Chinese, or ethnic Chinese, or Chinese Filipino with a hyphen. But according to Kaisa Para Sa Kaunlaran, okay, the Chinese Filipino organization here in the Philippines, they say the proper way to refer to the Chinese in the Philippines is Chinese Filipino without hyphen. Now, for the missionologists and Christians, they, called, they were called heathens, pagans, unbelievers, and regen, which is coined by BSOP alumnus, Dr. David Chu, split-level Christian, syncretistic, and our very own Dr. Chu Tan also called them folk evangelical Christians, okay? And we have another professor who wrote uh, about the Chinese in the Philippines and called them Chap Chai Lomi Christians, meaning a mixed-mixed Chinese, or mixed-mixed Christianity. Now, the Chinese also called themselves Lan Lang, which means our people, Tiongkok Lang, Tiongkok means China, or people from China, Ban Lam Lang, okay? People from the southern Min, Hua Din, um, Chinese people, Hua E, Chinese descendants, okay? They also call themselves Chinese, Chinoy, Chinoy with CH or Huana, okay? The word Huana actually is used to refer to the Filipinos, okay? And it means, with my apologies for what the Chinese have been using this term for the longest time, I'm very sorry because the word Huana means barbarians, okay? Okay. And so we see that there were prejudices between the Chinese and the Filipinos for the longest time. However, in the research of um, Otley, Henry Otley Bayer, he says that the Chinese and the Filipinos pre-Hispanic period, they are good friends. However, it was during the colonization of the Roman, of, of the Spaniards, okay, not Romans, but the Spaniards that they tried segregation, okay? Division between the two groups to avoid these two groups fighting against or uniting and fighting against the Spaniards. But anyway, um, some Chinese who find themselves very Chinese and see those Chinese who cannot speak the Chinese language will call those people as Huana also, okay? Meaning they are already Filipinized, okay? So who is a Chinese Filipino? According to Teresita Angsi, 
A Chinese Filipino, sociologically speaking, is somebody who has some sort of Chinese parentage or a degree of Chinese parentage. He or she should have a degree of knowledge with Chinese language, okay? Or Chinese education, or Chinese tradition and practices, or they are called by their neighbors as Chinese. And so I created this culture scale, meaning that a Chinese Filipino can be more Chinese or more Filipino as they live in this country, okay? And that could be a choice or situations that happen along the way, okay? So it can be more Chinese or Sinicized or more Filipinized or more Filipino. Now, kaisa para sa Kaunlaran Incorporated, they call Chinoy, meaning Chinese Filipino, okay? So if we have coconuts or bananas, we have Chinoy. Chinois are Chinese Filipinos, okay? Now, uh, in my dissertation, I created a profile about the Chinese in the Philippines, and I discovered that there are Chinese, different kinds of Chinese in this country. There were the old immigrants, those who entered the country from the late 19th century until the 19th, until 1975, okay? And those who entered post-1975 are the new immigrants. The reason why I divided them into that uh, time period, it's because in 1975, the Philippine president, Ferdinand Marcos, pro, um, gave a mass naturalization or mass citizenship granted to the Chinese in the Philippines. And it was that time that many Chinese have become Filipino citizens. Okay, so most of the old immigrants became Filipino citizens during the 1975 mass naturalization by President Marcos. So anyway, we have the old immigrants, we have the new immigrants, and we have the Chinois. The Chinois are those second, third, fourth, fifth gener generation Chinese. And then we have those Chinese with Chinese citizenship and who struggle with their passports, okay? And then we have those Chinese who work overseas, and then we have those Chinese who were in this mixed marriage or inter-ethnic marriages, and then we have their children, the Chinese mestizos. So each of them have their own stories to tell. Now, I won't tell those stories because I don't have that much time, but what I want to tell you is that even though I gathered all the data about all these Chinese or different kinds of Chinese, it's so hard to create meaning out of all this uh, data. And so cultural hybridity was able to, to help me give meanings to all the data that I gathered, okay? So I want to introduce three hybridity theories today. So the, the first one is, I guess many of you know Homi Baba, okay? Baba, um, it, in the book Location of Culture, I use his theory of the unhomed, okay? Baba says, to be unhomed is not to be homeless, nor can the unhomely be easily accommodated in that familiar division of the social life into private and public spheres. In other words, to be unhomed doesn't necessarily mean you don't have a home. To be unhomed is somebody who doesn't feel at home in your home. <laughs> so you are always in a liminal state. You're always in transition. You're not part of this, and yet you're not part of that. Okay, so being at home. Now, Baba himself um, migrated to the United States, and I think it was during that period also that he also felt this, I, he felt this being at home or being in the liminal state. Okay, so Baba's unhomely theory enabled me to understand further the data that I gathered about the immigrants, most especially, who doesn't feel at home when they first came to the Philippines. And then after living in the Philippines for the longest time, when they, whenever they return to China, they don't feel at home anymore in China. Okay. However, the unhomely theory does not only uh, apply to the Chinese old and new immigrants. It also applies to the Chinois or the Chinese with Chinese uh, citizenship. For example, the Chinese with Chinese citizenship may hold a Taiwan passport or a China passport. Okay. For the second generation Chinese with Chinese citizenship, they have to choose between a Taiwan or a China passport, okay? Now, before China become a booming nation, like she is right now, 
many of the Chinese in the Philippines will choose to get a Taiwan passport, okay? Like I used to be, okay? <laughs> However, every time I want to go abroad or even to enter Taiwan, I need to get a Taiwan visa, okay? It's crazy, right? I have a Taiwan passport, but I need a Taiwan visa to enter Taiwan. So, my Taiwan passport and my Taiwan citizenship is all an imaginary or imagination, okay? So it's not <laughs> real. <laughs> but of course, Taiwan will allow me to get this citizenship if I will live in Taiwan for at least one year without leaving the country, okay? But anyway, that's another story. But the point that I'm trying to say is that many Chinese with Chinese, Chinese citizenship who were born in this country do experience unhomely feelings because of not being able to discover where they do belong, okay? So let me introduce to you Milo. It's not in your notes, I know, I'm sorry. Milo said, I visited China because I joined our Tong Hui or the Family Clan Association. That's how I, was, I am able to go to China. But when I was there, nobody knew me, so I came back. What, what he meant, but nobody knew me, knew me, he went to his own uh, Hyudi or his own uh, hometown. And unfortunately, the hometown, the people, the relatives don't know him, don't know his family, okay? So he felt a stranger in that hometown. And also they felt at home with all the labels and name calling that was given to the Chinese all throughout the century, okay? And like I said, there were, there's diminishing prejudices between the Chinese and Filipinos, and that's a very good development, okay? Now, I'll, I need to skip this part because of uh, time. Now, this is something funny. Uh, a, a young Chinoy went to China to study Mandarin, okay? And when he came back, his uncle asked him, what did you learn in your one month stay in China? And then he said, I learned Mai Tang Lao, Sin Ke, and Ken Ta Chi. <laughs> so in other words, even though they were in China for immersion, they cannot really learn the language because their heart belongs to the Philippines. And their native tongue is already Filipino and English. So, the unhomely Chinese Filipinos experience unhomeliness not just for the immigrants, but for all the different kinds of Chinese. For the old and new immigrants, they feel unhome because they are new in this country. For the Chinois, they have dual identities, Chinese and Filipino. For the Chinese citizens, they have imaginary citizenship. For the overseas Chinese Filipino workers, of course, when they live in another country, they feel unhome. For the spouses in mixed marriages, I don't have time to share about this, but you can read my book. <laughs> um, they feel unhome because the Chinese spouse does not feel welcome in the Filipino community, and the Filipina spouse does not feel welcome in the Chinese community. And so there's these clashes of cultures that happen. And for the Chinese mestizos, they also feel unhome. There's one uh, informant I have, he is a tall, uh, Chinese Filipino or Chinese mestizo, okay? But his skin is very dark. He's a third generation Chinese mestizo. And so when he, he, he studied in a Chinese school, and when he became a Christian, he wanted to attend a Chinese church. And so when he went to the Chinese church, he felt at home because he said, nobody welcomed me because they thought I am Filipino, okay? So it's really sad, it's really sad. But it's good that this Christian continued on in his faith. <laughs> and so he told me that it took him years to gain the trust of the leaders and see, oh, that uh, he's, a, he's a Chinese mestizo. <laughs> and it's really sad, okay? And that's one of the things that we need to, to discuss in churches. We have to tell churches to embrace cultures and also to avoid prejudices. And prejudices can happen not just in the Chinese church because prejudices is not just about ethnicity. Usually it's about social class. Anyways, so for the unholy Chinese in the Philippines, this is the picture of my ang guama, uh, my ang ma, okay, so my grandmother. So she became a Christian when she was about to, you know, to pass away, okay? Somebody shared to her in the hospital, and she accepted Christ as her personal Lord and Savior, but my cousin 
con insisted that it's, it was more on a psychological effect because she's dying and she wants to make sure that, you know, uh, she will accept Jesus Christ just to be sure she will go to heaven. But anyway, I, I hope I will see my grandma in heaven. But anyway, for the unhomely Chinese in the Philippines, just 2% are Christians, okay? So I want to introduce the gospel for the unhomely. Unhome on earth, at home in heaven. Sojourners on earth, and it's a temporal state. Plights and problems have faith in God. No time to elaborate. Okay, situational approach, second theory. Bart discovered two things about ethnicity. It is exclusive not just because of no contact with outside world, but it persists despite contact with other ethnic groups. So Bart is presenting the fact that ethnicities are not boxed or immune from outside world. However, ethnicities somehow continue to persist. Now, the, the theory of Bart develops into concepts like migration, transnationalism, flexible citizenships by Ai Hua Ong, and third cultures, okay? Now, um, to illustrate the situational approach, for example, like Duterte, when he is uh, um, campaigning, he will stress that he's a third generation Chinese, that his grandfather is actually Chinese, okay? And when Cory Aquino become the president of the Philippines, she actually um, embraced her Chinese-ness when the World Co Association, Co is the, one of the last names in the Philippines, anyway, my real last name in Chinese is actually Co, okay? So I know this. The, Co, the World Co Association uh, gave, uh, gave her um, a special honor and contributed a sum of money for her governance, okay? And so she embraced that and welcomed the World Coal Association leaders, okay? So her son, Noi, Noi, Noi Aquino, when he became the president of the Philippines, he also embraced his uh, Chinese-ness in the sense that it, it was in his term that he made the Chinese New Year a national holiday. Yeah, okay. So anyway, another example of um, situational approach is uh, written by Richard Chu, okay? Richard Chu says that many of the Chinese in the Philippines during the Spanish period tend to do addition in terms of gods, okay? Like keep on adding gods, than replacement, okay? So when they believe in Buddha, they also want to believe in the different gods of Taoism, and also even the gods of Christianity. So they do addition instead of replacement. Now, Teresita Angsi, another scholar, she said that the Chinese in the Philippines have the tendency to be very syncretistic. In other words, they love to mix, mix religion, okay? I think the pragmatic attitude of the Chinese in the Philippines, the desire to be prosperous, prosperous led them to become syncretistic in terms of their religion, okay? And so for that, I would want to suggest that there's a need to help the Chinese to understand that in Christianity, there is no addition. They need to make a replacement. They need to replace all the gods that they believe and only believe in the one true God. Okay, let's go to the third one. It's by Joel Robbins. Now, Robbins wrote the book, Becoming Sinners. This is also his dissertation, okay? Robbins' uh, theory about hybridity is like the halo halo of the Philippines, okay? Mix, yet not mix, okay? So like the halo halo, we have ubiyam, we have makapuno, garbanzos, which by the way, was introduced by the Indians. And then leche flan, introduced by the Spaniards, the mung bean by the Chinese, and bananas, okay? And they say that the shaved ice were introduced by the Japanese and the uh, ice cream on top introduced by the Americans. <laughs> so amazing Alma. I met this Alma. This is not his, her real picture. <laughs> Alma is bilingual. She's very good in her Tagalog and very good in her Minanhua. And she knows the, China, the Filipino customs very well. Now, the question is what kind of identity this Alma has? I believe that, you know, in the in line with Joel Robbins' mixed yet unmixed theory, she is actually comp doing compartmentalization, okay? 
I think compartmentalization is something more familiar with you. Okay, so for this, I can say that the, the Chinese in the Philippines who have the opportunity to explore in different cultures have a pivotal role in global missions. And so I end my presentation. Thank you.